host of Broke, my name is Kieran, and today we are back at one of the original casinos that I like to hit up, or that you guys have seen featured quite a bit. A ton of over or abroad players, I guess would be better said, have been coming here, and they're honestly really good at poker. And it makes the game suck really bad. It just feels like I'm playing at the Bellagio, which I don't like playing at, so I don't really come here. Anyways, it's been a while. I want to change the scenery. The garden's been treating us really well, but let's not overextend our welcome. So I thought I'd come back here and check it out. Get a change of scenery. I'll let you guys know how the games go. I don't want to waste any time. There are so many hands to go in this session. And from what I understand, the more hands, the better, more, the merrier even. So let's get right into it. We're going to kind of speed run through most of these, unless there's a couple of really crazy ones I want to go over. In this very first hand, this is the very first hand actually of our session. We sit down at a brand new table that was opened up and we're going to be shorthanded for probably 90% of the session. Hijack opens to $30. We're playing six handed. I look down at king three of hearts here from the button. I make the call. The big blind makes a call and the flop comes eight, three deuce rainbow with the action on the initial razor. He goes for a massive seabed here of two thirds for $60. Well, I didn't call with the hand like this to fold when I make a pair. So I'm going to go ahead and make the call. Hopefully I can hit a king or a three big blind folds. We're going off to a turn card that comes a beautiful king of diamonds. That is a bink. Also brings a backdoor flush draw with the action checked over to me now. I'm hoping, praying even that my opponent has like jacks, tens, some kind of middling pair, obviously, or a pretty solid pocket pair. With the action on me, I decide to bet pretty small here, actually. I bet $65, so I'm going about a third the size of the pot now. Looking to target ace highs, hopefully they're not believing. Unfortunately, he decides to make the fold, but the reason I add this hand in is because we're going to be pretty much playing a ton of hands against a specific opponent in the session, and... It's always good to start off with a win, right? Let's get this ball. Let's get this show on the road. Moving right along in this session, the button limps here. I find myself in the big blind with eight, nine of diamonds. The same opponent for the last hand. Going to go and isolate. This is a hand definitely good enough to isolate. I make it $50 to go. Can even go a little bit bigger out of position. 5X is already pretty steep, though. Our opponent makes a call. We're going off to a flop that comes ace, nine, three with two clubs and a heart. With the action on me, I think that checking here is pretty reasonable. We can let him blast off with his flush draws. We can let him blast off with absolute air balls. C betting is also fine. Either way, the action ends up checking through. We're going off to a turn card that comes with seven of diamonds. Doesn't really change much the board texture. I decided to check once again. And our opponent takes the bait and bets $100. He's leaving himself about $125 behind. With the action back on me, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I'm never going to be folding against this specific player on any run out besides maybe a club. So if that's the case, and I think that he's on a flush draw, I'd rather get as much money in the middle now while he still has some equity, while he still has the opportunity to call. I'd hate to make a call here and the river comes a brick and it just goes check, check. I think, believe it or not, there is some merit and some value in betting or going all in here, I should say. That's what I go ahead and do. I jam all in for 225 effective. He ends up making the call pretty quickly. The river comes with three of diamonds, pairing the bottom card. I end up showing my cards and they are in fact good. So happy that we were able to read and adjust to the situation as it came to me and happy that we made that jam there. Maybe it looks weird to some of you guys, but when you guys start playing a lot of live poker and specifically at like a specific casino, there's a lot of little things in the game that you pick up. And uh, yeah, against a recreational, um, he probably got unlucky in some spots, but specifically this one uh, and specifically this hand, I just think that I was able to get him to call off, call off with weaker, really. Continuing along here, I find myself in early position. I make it $30 to go with Queen Jack offsuit. Only the big blind decides to make the call. He has around $200 behind in his stack. And the flop comes out pretty reasonable as it comes ace, seven, queen. There are two clubs out there. With the action checked over to me, I think this is the hand we're pretty happy to get the showdown as quickly as possible. I check it back. The turn is a nine of spades. Brings a backdoor flush draw to add to the initial flush draw on the flop. Once again, pretty happy to just check this through, which we do. The river card comes the ace of spades. Does bring in the backdoor flush draw, but with our opponent deciding to check here, I think we can consider in some aspects going for thin value. In hindsight, it is a little too thin. I think maybe if we had like king queen with like the king of spades, that's a little more reasonable. But for the most part, I think this is... We should just be looking to get a show now with the hand like Queen Jack. I end up deciding to go against that better judgment again in hindsight. I bet $50. Our opponent pretty quickly makes the call. We show our hand, thinking we're good at the time. And our opponent pretty quickly shows Ace-4 offsuit for trips. Nice hand to you, sir. Value owning yourself is going to happen when you're willing to go thin. Unfortunate that it didn't work out in our favor this time. 
attempting to keep this ball rolling. And this following hand under the gun makes it $30 to go. The small blind calls, which is the player from the last couple hands. I find myself in the big blind, and I look down at 10 out of clubs. Plays reasonable as a three bet, plays fine, you know, out of position. Multi-way seems okay with the suited connector as such. I call as well. We're going off to a flop that comes king, 10, deuce, rainbow. With the action checking through here, we're going to go ahead and realize our equity, which comes a beautiful 10 of hearts. Bing, bang, bong. That brings a backdoor flush draw, but again, we do have trips here. I'm not really worried about all that much. With the action checked over to me, I decided to bet here for $25. Going fairly small, but again, I can kind of understand what I'm trying to do here. Going a quarter pot is probably too small. I think a third is a little better, but that is what I bet. Both players make the call and we're going off to a river card, hoping for a nine of hearts, but it's pretty much the polar opposite. It comes the ace of clubs. Well, that's not a great card. Queen Jack obviously comes in. And even more worrisome when the small blind decides to lead out off of his 200 or so dollar stack for $75. I think about it for a second and consider the merit in jamming here for what, again, would be in the neighborhood of $200, which would be my raise, actually. I just don't see it. I think that my hand is too good to turn into a merge. Like, a what is it, a bluff, I guess? And it's just like, on this board, I, I'm going to be getting called by better. It just exists, you know? So... I decided to just make the call. Oddly enough, the initial raiser ends up tank calling as well, and we all have to show our hands. Well, we don't actually, because a small blind snap flips over queen jack. So he's going to go ahead and take this pot down. Unfortunate for us that it comes an ace. If it comes a nine on the river, we just get all the money anyways. So either way, can't kill yourself over it. I think it just lends itself to being a cooler. At this point, we are five-handed, which is not that great, but you know what is great? Getting pocket queens here, especially after under the gun, the cutoff, the button, all decide to limp and I find myself in the big blind. I decide to throw out the beautiful isolation race to $70. Only the cutoff makes a call and we're going off to a flop and I see the disgusting ace of spades in the window. And what you may ask can get worse than that is it being followed by a king. That's not very, uh, it's not very good, but this is a pretty good board for my range. I decided to see bet pretty small here, actually, $45 to go. The opposition decides to make the call. The pot is growing slowly, I may say, but we're going off to a turn card that comes a 10 of hearts. Okay, I guess. Most queen jack suited hands I think I'd consider isolating with, and uh, moreover, I do block the ones that would be, I guess, limp calling. So uh, why not blast off? I decided to make it $250. Again, I'd be doing this with queen jack. I'd probably be doing this with aces and pocket kings and ace king as well so why not continue doing it when i guess i'm turning pocket queens into a bluff which you probably shouldn't do it's good enough to just try to take it to showdown but who cares this is not why i play poker not everything has to be perfect and nip and tuck sometimes you can just go against the grain i guess you could say anyways our opponent thinks about it for a second before luckily letting it go so we're gonna take that really happy about winning that pot and we're gonna go ahead and continue trekking along if you guys have got to this point of the video and haven't done me the honor by clicking the like button, if you guys would do that, it goes such a long way in helping these videos become a little more discoverable. The poker audience, although it is a niche, it's bigger than our current audience, and it would mean the world to me if you guys could like, comment, and subscribe. You guys already know that I do a bunch of random giveaways and stuff. The more subs, the more money I can just give back to you guys. So, early position limps. I find myself in the cutoff with Jack-10 offsuit. I decide to isolate here. Probably one of the uh, worst hands I'll be isolating with, but again, Jack-10 plays pretty reasonable post-flop. I decide to make it $50 to go. Early position limper makes the call, and we're going off to a pretty reasonable flop that comes king-queen-3. There is two clubs out there, and luckily I do hold the jack of clubs. With the action starting off on the opponent, he checks. I see bet for $45, and he calls. Going to a turn card, hoping to hit one of our immediate outs, or even better so, if we could somehow pick up some extra equity. Oh, look at that. The turn is a beautiful seven of clubs. So we now pick up a flush draw. The weird thing is my opponent decides to lead out here for the old donk lead for $50. Okay, I can kind of see how this makes sense. Our opponent can definitely have a ton of middling value hands, but the problem is he has around 350 behind, and I think this is the only point in the hand, if I believe I can get him to fold, I can go for it. There's fold equity now. The last thing I want to do is get to the river. He bets like $100. He only has 200 behind. I jam bluff. He's just never going to fold. So why not try to take advantage of the moment right now? Seize the moment, they say. With the action on me, I decide to just go ahead and jam it all in for about $400 effective. 
Our opponent goes deep into the tank. Again, with our added equity, which is the flush draw, as well as probably having range advantage on this board as well against an early position limp call. I'm putting him specifically at this moment on a middling pair, maybe like a queen jack, maybe like a king nine kind of holding. Our opponent ends up making the fold, luckily, and he shows us the king of clubs. So folding top pair, second nut flush draw is quite uh, interesting. Our image is turning from being a psychomaniac to, I guess, only having value in this spot. Luckily for us, we end up taking yet another pot down. Things have been mostly hitting in our direction and hopefully continues on for the rest of the session. Spoiler alert, there's quite a bit of rocky roads ahead and you don't want to click away because this is an absolute crazy episode. In this next hand, I look down at ace eight offsuit here. We're playing six hand and I'm in the hijack. This is going to be right at the bottom of the opening range. So I go ahead and open, especially considering how passive most of these players have been playing. Either way, I open, button, small blind call, and the flop comes ace five, three with two hearts. With the action checked over to me, I think this is a nice hand to have in a check back range. I think it works really well specifically because I have the ace of hearts. So I do block the nut flush draw from coming or from existing. The turn card comes a 10 of diamonds. This is pretty reasonable. Again, there's three of us in this hand. The action is checked to me once again. I decided to bet here for value for $40. The button ends up folding, and then the small blind decides to do something I wasn't expecting by raising to 150. Not a whole lot of value that I can see on this board. Sure, fives and threes all exist there. Those sets are very common. Not a whole lot of two pairs exist. Maybe ace five suited, ace three suited, possibly ace 10 suited as well, but maybe that hand decides to three bet. Not really sure. I make the call because my hand is just way too strong to fold. We're going off to a river card that comes in nine of hearts. Does bring in the front door flush draw, which was a little worrisome. But again, I do have the ace of hearts, which does block that. With the action on my opponent, he decides to jam all in for $410. The action is now back onto me, which means that all of this decision is on my shoulders. There's a lot going through my mind. I think that having the ace of hearts is a good problem here. We can know that he can never end up on the river with an ace high flush because I blocked that. So now we have to deduce what's left of his range. I think he can have all the two pairs credibly as well as a set. So does a two pair hand even just jam for near pot, what it feels like at least, on this river? I think probably not. Maybe not. This is a pretty scary card. The front door flush comes in. We're just kind of left in this weird predicament. Like, what bluffs does he have here? Maybe a random missed straight drop? I think at this point, I just don't want to be bluffed in this spot. And that's not a really good attitude to have. I think you should just play your hand for what it is. I just pretty much, I'm, I'm heavily weighting the fact that I have the ace of hearts and that I feel like I've totally underrepped my hand. I end up making the hero call here. My opponent actually sheepishly shows 10-5 of clubs. And not that I think he was ashamed to show it. I He said it like he thought he wasn't good. He said it like, I only have two pairs. So, I don't know. Interesting. I don't know if he was turning his hand into a bluff because the way he said that, it sounded like it was. But either way, he got the maximum value for myself. I think if I played this hand more traditionally by c-betting the flop, checking the turn, and again, he probably would have bet the river and I could just call, we would have lost significantly less. So, there's an example of... Why playing unorthodox is a little goofy sometimes. We end up losing the maximum in a spot we just didn't need to. I find myself in the hijack with King 10 of hearts. I race the 30. Button, big blind call. We're going to have three ways to a flop that is not very good. That comes 7-3 deuce rainbow. The one thing I will say is that I haven't been c-betting a lot because most of the good hands that I raise, they just don't hit these boards. I think by c-betting, I just look super strong here. If any of these people have been paying attention over the last two or three hours, they've seen that I haven't been c-betting too much. So... Let's take advantage of that. I make it $50 to go. Both players make the call, which lends me to believe that these people aren't looking at my current playing of hand distribution. So we're going off to a flop or a turn, excuse me, that comes a wonderful three of hearts. Why is that great? We pick up a flush draw as equity to our holding, and that means that I can probably go for a big sizing. With the action checked over to me, I just had to go bonkers here, going about 80 or 70% of the pot, $200 to go. Our button does the old snap call, which for the most part, when people do this, it's never really a good hand. Either way, we're going off to river heads up that comes an ace of diamonds. All right, I can work with that. It's time to grow a pair of cojones and specifically represent one, right? We got to represent that we just got the nuts here. So I decided to bet $700. Our opponent thinks about it for a brief moment before deciding to fold. Let's go. That's a really nice pickup for us. He would later on tell us that he had pocket nines there. 
I think we pretty much put him on his range there properly. And again, we got lucky because I think on any other river besides a heart or an ace specifically, we're just never going to get him to fold. Happy that we took advantage of the situation. And I'm really happy that we got a live read and I was able to share it with you guys. And, and specifically when I get live reads that you guys can see with me, I think that's really interesting and informing. So just try to use that again and be cautious against not recreational players. But next time you're in a game with a recreational a snap calling, making snap actions, they're trying to exude confidence or exude this like alpha mentality when for the most part, their hands never really that great. Like, have you ever done that with the nuts? Maybe you have because you're like a pro, but I don't know. I've never ran into the nuts that way. But again, I said this publicly now, so somebody might do the old reverse reverse on me. Either way, we've got some more hands to talk about, so let's get into that. So as you guys can see here, things have been going pretty decent for us. Besides the ace eight hole debacle, we've been doing a pretty good job of keeping pots coming in our direction. In this next hand, we're looking to continue that streak as the action folds to me, and I look down at Ace King here from the button. There's an EP limper here, so early position limper. So I isolate to fifty dollars. The small blind makes the call, and the action is now on the big blind, who decides to three bet to two hundred dollars. Well, the action's now back on me, and I decide that this is a great spot to try to get the money in the middle. My opponent only has what I think is around eight hundred to nine hundred dollars, so I decide to make it five hundred fifty dollars to go. Looking to get my opponent to either fold some hands that might have some equity, like maybe you can fold pocket eights, pocket sevens. But moreover, again, I'm just okay with getting the money in the middle. 100 or 90 big blinds is really pretty standard with Ace King, it feels like. Action's back on him. He decides to 5-bet jam to $960 total. A little more than what I anticipated, but again, we didn't 4-bet half of his stack to fold. So I make the call, and we're going out to a run out that um, doesn't really help us kind of just how things have been going it comes nine high our opponent says that he thinks that i'm good i show ace king and he shows pocket tens so unlucky for us there uh again i can't really kill myself for this at all i think that if an ace or king comes i look it's pretty pretty standard right it's gonna happen half the time at that so sometimes you win a coin flip sometimes you lose just feels a little unfortunate that i've been on the wrong side of these pretty frequently but this is not a vlog about me whining and moaning in your ear. It's about the reality of understanding that, hey, if that flips goes in my favor, this is a super awesome session. As it stands now, we have to reload. We're into this game for $2,000, and we're only sitting with like 1K in front of us because honestly, I'm kind of frustrated, and I just don't want to top off to the actual max amount. I put aside some money I wanted to play for this game, and I don't know, I'm trying to stick to it. So like I said, trying to rifle through these hands, score the next hand, and let's talk more about some poker. This following hand under the gun makes it $30 to go, plus one calls. I'm in the cutoff with 8-9 suited. Suited connectors, going to get in there, going to be getting dirty. I'm cool with it. I make the call. We're going to have to a flop that's very favorable as it comes 8-7-5 with two clubs and a diamond. We don't flop any back to where flush draws, obviously, but we do have ourselves top pair and a gutter ball. With the action on our initial razor, he makes it a very big bet of $55. Going about half the size of the pot is, again, pretty big multi-way on a board that just shouldn't be very good for him all that often next to act player makes a call action on me never folding i call as well we're going off to a turn card that comes with three of diamonds it does bring a backdoor flush draw and this time the initial razor checks and that middle player decides to bet 105 action on me here i'm just again never going to be folding we can be behind but our escape strategy is the old six here so i make the call here and oddly enough, the initial razor calls as well. Okay, we're going multi-way to the river in a big spot, and it comes an unbelievable six of spades. That's pretty much the cleanest river I could have ever asked for, and even more exciting when the action checks to me. Well, like I said, on this clean river, I'm never not going to be betting for value, but the question is, how big do I want to make it? There's quite a, you know, quite a bit of money in the middle already in excess of 500 bucks. Seems like going a little bit on the bigger side makes sense. I think these people are just never going to believe me. After seeing me and hearing me talk about bluffing with that King-10 hand, uh, seeing that I lost to the Pocket-10s hand, maybe they just think I'm willing to blast off. Maybe they think I'm on tilt. I make it $400 to go, leaving myself somewhere in the neighborhood of two to $300 behind. Something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Our opponent, I don't even get my chips out fast enough. The initial raises just snap all in. Well, middle player here decides to fold. I'm just never folding here. If you have 9-10 somehow, like, dude... All glory to you, buddy. 
uh, but I didn't get to this river and decide to bet 80% of my stack to fold. I call. If it's a cooler, it's a cooler. Luckily for us, it's a cooler, but not in the way you're expecting. Our opponent also has a 9 here, not with a 10, but with the Queen of Diamonds. So we ended up picking up a gut shot as well as we mentioned that backdoor flush draw. He did have diamonds here, so unlucky for our opponent as a 6 of diamonds might have got him a little more money. But again, happy that we were able to chop that pot. Like I said, not a lot of clean outs, so what we were complaining about earlier with the ace-king hand, everything just turns around in some aspect, right? We end up getting a clean river here, ended up chopping up a little bit of money on the side. Well, we are in the second or the latter half of this session, so let's go over. Like I said, there is an incredible hand that you guys can see in the title. Let's hop into it. Uh, lately, I've been trying to just do things a little bit unorthodox. For good or for bad, you know, for better or for worse. I don't know if it's helping, but I'll look back at it and figure it out. This next hand is an example of doing things a little weirder. In this situation, early position limps here. Recreational player looking to isolate here. So I looked on an ace nine offsuit. Again, this is okay here. I'm going to hijack. I decided to make it $50 to go. Unfortunately, a really solid pro when the cutoff decides to make the call. The big blind makes a call and that limper makes a call. We're going infinitely too many ways to this flop that comes 10-6 deuce. With the action checked over to the in position player. I'm just like I said, we talked about not going to be bluffing multi-way with ace high here. The in position player that solid pro decides to bet out $65. Action ends up folding over to me. I think with ace high and a reasonable backdoor straight draw, eh, I could be good here sometimes, and I can probably take the pot away from my opponent sometimes as well, depending on the run out. So I make the very courageous call here. And we're going off to a turn card that comes the eight of clubs. It does introduce a backdoor flush draw, which I don't contain, which I think is a good thing. We don't want to be blocking the flush draw here. Our opponent's definitely going to be C betting with the backdoor like ace X a club situation. So I decided to bet here for $160. 160 bucks seems like a reasonable price to pay. I think we can, again, get actually called here some ridiculous times by a worse hand. And like we talked about, this is just we're getting crazy with it. I don't know how this is good for my range. Doesn't matter. I think I'm just playing the player more than playing my cards. As stupid or cheesy as that sounds. Like, that's something you'd read out of a poker book from 1985, it feels like. But let's try to bring the old into the new, right? You guys see all these kids wearing these really, really baggy jeans again now. Then they went to skinny jeans. Now they're back to, like, bell bottoms. Either way, we're not here to start new fashion trends. But maybe some new poker trends. Our opponent thinks about it for a while before eventually deciding to fold. Weird, I know. Odd, maybe even. I know. I realize it. But we got the chips, and that's all that matters, right? All right, moving on to this next hand. The button decides to open here. I find myself in the small blind with ace-king offsuit. I decided three bet here to $155. A hand this strong deserves a price this big. Well, I don't know if that's the case. I'd probably do it with any hand I three bet here. But our opponent decides to make the call. He has somewhere in the neighborhood of $800 in his stack. Flop comes six, three, jack, two diamonds and a club. All right, that's pretty much the worst flop we could ask for. We don't connect with it in any way. Probably hits our opponent's range a little better here than us. And lastly, I don't have a diamond in my hand. With the action checked over to my opponent now, don't have a C bet on this board, he decides to bet a really, really small number here, $80. Well, this is like somewhere in the neighborhood of one-fifth of the pots. Can't be folding my two overs. Again, they can be good at some frequency here. I make the call. We're going off to a turn card that comes as seven of hearts. Doesn't change much of the board texture here. I check over to my opponent once again, seeing how he'd react to this card. And he decides to bet once again on the very micro size of 130. My hand, although it seems ridiculous, can be good sometimes here. My opponent can be going very thin here, so I can possibly steal the pot from him on the river with the price being so small. How often do we need to hit our outs here or how often are we even good here to make the call? I decide to make the call here as I can be pretty sticky post-flop. You guys understand the MO. And we're going off to a river card that comes a four of clubs. Why you guys may be saying that that doesn't change very much of the runout, even though it puts four to straight in a three bed pot. Having a five here is just very difficult. You know, it's just it's just hard to have a five, at least a bare five. Maybe pocket fives is reasonable. Again, we can't just totally discount our opponent from having a hand like 5-4. But given the fact that I went for a pretty large 3-bet sizing preflop, I just don't see that hand really existing in my opponent's range. So when I check it over to him and he decides to go all in here for about $575, the wheels are turning. Maybe a lot of people would have folded on the flop. 
Maybe even the turn was even an easier fold. And for sure on this river, I think everyone's folding here as well. I don't know. I don't like doing anything snap. I start thinking about it. What's good here? What can we say is a pro here? I think the good thing or the good problem we have is that we don't have a diamond. So we can't block any of the hands that exist in my opponent's range that contain a diamond. Specifically, ace x of diamonds, king x of diamonds. These are really, really important things to mention because those are hands that are probably going to have to bluff shuff this river um, when it's checked over to them after seeing a complete lack of aggression for myself. Over beyond that, as we mentioned, I have a pretty cap range here. I probably never have a hand better than one pair. I don't think I'm ever doing this with jacks. I don't think I'm ever checking three streets with a set. I don't think that I ever have a five here in my range as well. Uh, maybe, very maybe, I'd have one combination of a five here. And that specific combination would have to be like ace five of diamonds. Or again, a, a hand that contains a suit from the flop. That would be like ace five X. I don't know. It's just what's getting my gears grinding in my head. All I can think about is that I don't have a diamond. I don't think that he can have a five here. I don't have a five here. Come on. Can you really bet a jack here for value? And this opponent that I'm, I'm, I'm here with, from what I understand, seems to be a recreational. I just don't think he's going to be going for thin value with one pair. So I think I needed to break it all down to you to get kind of an insight of what the hell's going on in my head. I end up making the hero call here with ace high on a board that just doesn't lend itself to being good all that often. But we get the magical word. You're good. You're good. Can you just smoke it? Mm, you got balls. How are you calling me with ace high? I don't have a diamond. Okay, so. Yeah, it's not. You know, not to be petty. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Ace high. Nice time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? How'd you find me, brother? You just thought I was bluffing? No, I've, I've been folding hands all day. I'm honestly just on tilt because I've lost so much, so I'm so good. It's not like I thought you. Your, yeah, your bluff is perfect. Yeah, maybe nothing. Even just like just, no. Well, or you just felt like I was bluffing. To be quite honest, it was just such a bad river for you to like bet. Like yeah. I don't have a five, and you don't have a five on that river, no. and you have to be like super, super, like a high-end super player, like a yeah. Phil yeah. Ivey to bet the river with like a, like maybe Ace Jack. Yeah. So yeah, if yeah. you don't have Ace Jack and you don't have a five, and I don't have a diamond, so like all those things came together and you bet so much yeah you, you bet like i think i had a pair like a little pair <laughs> well i don't think i think like you're just gonna check the river like fuck you know yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't think if you have like a7 you're gonna bet the river Again, yeah fuck nice call brother i wish i could pretend like, like it was skill was sick -ass call. <laughs> i wish i wish Are i could say it was skill, man. i like it i like Five. it nice bro it's funny because people always make the joke that, oh my God, Kieran, you're such a calling station or whatever the hell. Uh, I'm probably never going to be bluffing you. Somebody get, better let this poor gentleman know because uh, he obviously didn't have the memo. Either way, in this next hand, we look down at pocket tens here looking to capitalize towards the end of our session. We've been playing for about four hours now. About time for me to get the hell home. I look down at a situation that I can't miss. I make it $30 to go. We get three callers here. Ace Three deuce with two hearts. Pretty nice for us. I do contain a heart in my hand, which is, again, pretty reasonable. I decided to seabed here on the larger side for $65. If I'm going to be seabedding a board like this, again, larger or a check probably makes the best sense. Unfortunately for us, we get two calls here, which, again, is not horrible, but maybe somebody has a good draw here or somebody has some overs. Either way, we're going off to a turn card that comes a horrible eight of spades. Pairing the top card is never great especially because it's going to be hard for me to ever have this in my range. Luckily for us, the action ends up checking through, though. All right, we're going off to a river, and somehow the river is even worse than the turn card was as it comes to Seven of Hearts. And now it brings in that front door flush draw that we were obviously worried about. Once again, the action luckily ends up checking through after the button tanks and decides better of it. We show our hand, and the opponent directly to our left actually showed pocket nines there, so... We won like the minimum technically, but I think we won the maximum with this given run out. Didn't help us out in any way and it just got worse and worse. And that's just going to happen sometimes. And luckily for us, we're at least able to win this pot going over to the last hand of this session. 
Finally, we find ourselves in a situation under the gun with Ace Queen offsuit. I decide to raise here to $30. The plus one player, again, that solid pro makes a call. Another solid pro from the big blind makes a call as well. We're going three ways off to a flop that's very favorable as it comes Queen 9 7 Rainbow. With the action checked over to me, I think I make a massive error here by not C betting. Obviously, we talk about all the time about how boards don't help us. I think sometimes just keep it simple, stupid. Bet when you have a really good hand. This is a situation where I think I should probably have done that. I check it over to the solid pro in position. He makes a bet for $40 or $45. Pulls back to me. I make the call. The turn card comes the eight of spades. Bring the backdoor flush run. Obviously now completes the straights that do exist. With the action checked over to the initial or to the in position player, I should say. He decides after quite a bit of thinking to check it back. So we're going off to a river, hoping to fade some pretty nasty ones, and uh, looks like uh, nobody was listening as it comes to six of clubs. Again, it doesn't bring in that backdoor flush draw, but what it does bring in is a uh, four liner. A 10 here is very much possible in my opponent's range, but from under the gun raise and under the gun one call, not a whole lot of 10s exist. Maybe pocket 10s and like ace 10, queen 10 obviously exists as well. For that reason, I decided to throw out a blocker bet of $30. We can obviously get called by hands that are inferior like Queen Jack and King Jack, maybe Jack Nine even. But we can also get a chance where if our opponent has better, they can obviously, obviously raise and we can get away from it a little easier. Or if they have like a two pair holding, they'll just call. We don't have to face a big bet on the river. Either way, our opponent thinks about it and ends up making the fold. That's going to close our session out here. I feel pretty solid, but I'm also feeling very hungry. So let's start over to me in the commerce parking lot. Talk a little bit about where the hell we're going next. Oh, oh gosh. Well, the session has come to a close, but there's a lot to talk about, a lot to unpack. So I'm going to run over to this place called Chica's Taco here in downtown LA. I'm going to grab some dinner for the missus. And yeah, let's wrap up the session properly at a different location that isn't commerce or its parking lot. Okay, so as you guys can see, change of plans. I ended up coming to King Taco here in LA. A little different, a little more homey. And uh, yeah, you guys can see that. Something you might not know about me. I speak fluent Spanish, not because I learned it at school, which I did take it for an easy A, but I'm actually half Latino. My mom is from El Salvador. My dad is from India. So the more you know. But let's talk more about today's session. So we were into the game for $2,000 and out for $2,303, but that doesn't really paint the entire situation. Ace high call was pretty, pretty juicy. Hope you guys enjoyed the little table talk afterwards. But beyond that, not much more to talk about. It was a pretty fun session just getting back into the mix of things here at the Commerce. I haven't been here in a while. The game was pretty stuck in the muck for me at least just every time i had good cards just things wouldn't happen in my favor i was getting called by a lot of junk but again just boards weren't hitting me or they were just running out not in our favor and uh beyond that it just feels good to make a ridiculous hero call and be correct and even more so when you're just stuck for piles and need a big comeback so either way i feel pretty happy with the way that things turned out we'll take a small win any day whenever it happened i added on i was frustrated um, and so much so that I didn't even top up my stack. I think I was down to like eight or $900 in my stack, 1500 being the max. And I was like, you know, screw it. Uh, if I'm not going to be running well, why even tempt fate? So either way, I appreciate you guys as always for coming and hanging out. Now it's time for me to grab the food, head over to the restaurant. And, uh, yeah, I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you guys so much for the continuous support. I'll see you guys very soon on an episode near you. Goodbye. Oh,